Christian Broadcast Ministries presents CBM Worship. We invite you to worship with us as we praise and worship our Lord together through music, prayer, and God's Word. We bring you CBM Worship from the Sanctuary of the Wayside Temple, 3809 Maple Avenue in Castalia, Ohio. We pray you'll be blessed and encouraged as we worship our Lord together. lift our praise to our Lord. Father, we thank you for a Savior, Lord, who has redeemed us, and Lord, who has captured our heart. And Father, we can say without any hesitation, we love you. We love the Savior. We're thankful for your spirit. And Lord, there's no turning back. Lord, the world holds nothing for us. Lord, the spirit of this world, we've renounced that spirit. We're of a different spirit. Lord, we thank you for the work that you've accomplished in our hearts. And Lord, we're resolved. We have decided to follow you. And we know down in our heart that Christ is enough. The bread of life, the living water, the good shepherd, the great I am come for our salvation. He is enough. Lord, we praise you today. We want to tell you that we love you, Lord. We ask you now for your blessing upon this service. We've gathered here in your name, Lord, to humble our hearts, to seek you with humble hearts. Lord, to call upon your name. We've come here, Lord, to worship you, to exalt the name of Jesus. Lord, bless this service. Bless each one in attendance today. I pray whether we're young or older, that your spirit will minister to our heart. Open our understanding. And Lord, should there be one here that needs to experience the new birth, this great salvation that we preach about, that we rejoice in. Lord, I pray your spirit today will draw them to the Savior. And Lord, bless this service as it goes beyond these walls. We ask you to send your word to that hungry heart. Lord, that broken soul that needs hope, that needs to see life in Christ, needs to experience this life that we 
have down in our hearts today. Lord, send forth your word, bless your word, honor it in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen and amen. Are you folks happy today? Yes. Amen. Can I see a good smile? Amen. You got to welcome somebody near you with a good smile today and tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. Amen. Appreciate that. What a wonderful message and song. You know, you live long enough this side of eternity, of course, you're going to experience some trials. You're going to go through some things that you cannot explain. I think most everybody's already been there a time or two, more than once in this walk of life. I trust the Lord today, and uh, I know that there's a better day coming. See, I know uh, what my future holds, and this world is troubled by death. 
but the world I'm going to will never be troubled by death again. And uh, this side of eternity, there's going to be a few trials. But as we walk through those, the Lord knows us. And he's got us in the palm of his hand, as it were. And he'll be with us. He'll give us the grace that we need to go through the situations we face. And just lean upon him, trust him. And uh, day by day, he'll give us strength and he will meet our needs. I can't explain that, but I, I trust him today. And uh, I'm glad that we have a message of, of real hope today. And, uh, you know, m many people in our world, they don't have a message of hope. They, I don't know how they face tomorrow. And when things come that uh, just upset their world and their world is gone, I don't know how they make it. Many of them don't. Some uh, can't endure without hope. A soul without hope is in a dark place indeed. Aren't you glad you know the Lord today? Aren't you glad that you, you have hope down in your spirit? I want you to open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 28. <clears throat> Isaiah 28, we'll begin at verse 1 in a moment. And I'd like to read down through verse 16. And uh, we're going to focus on the truth of verse 16 as we conclude the message today. Uh, <clears throat> I trust that each one of you present here, those of you listening by television, by radio, you are ready to listen closely to the Word of God. I want to encourage you to be of serious mind and prepare your heart to seek the Lord. The Lord doesn't uh, send His church into the earth to preach the Word for nobody to listen. He, he, his, and his expectation is for you to listen. And His expectation is that you will seek Him, seek Him with your heart, and uh, be ready to, to hear His Word in the sense of receiving it. You're ready to act upon it. We're living in a world today, church, that's ripe for God's judgment. Many are so overtaken with the cares of this life and with the excesses of food and drink and so-called good times, they're not prepared for the day of our Lord's coming. They're not listening. In fact, Jesus says that that day will come as a snare on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. I hope you'll listen closely today. Can you take heed to yourself? Jesus told us to do so. Can you take personal inventory and judge yourself in the sight of the Lord? Are you a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ? I think that question needs to be presented to the visible church, just like us in a congregation like this. But across the board, in every Christian denomination, every Christian church, all across the land, around the world, are you a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ? There are many people that are participating in form, but they, they, in a form of our religion, but they deny the power thereof. There's no work of the Spirit in their life. They, they have a, a, a tradition that they participate in, but to be in a vital personal relationship to Christ and to know Him as Savior, uh, they don't have that reality in their life. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ today? Are you a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I don't just serve the Lord on Sunday morning for an hour. I follow the Lord during the week. I'm sure you do. We want to cultivate a walk with the Lord. We walk with Him day by day. We should talk with Him. We should pray. We should seek Him in our personal devotional life. We should be concerned about honoring Him with a life of obedience. Uh, we should be living lives that... Uh, are consistent with our profession of faith. Are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus? Are you saved? You know, when I ask that question, if that gives you pause, or if it's language that seems awkward to you, then I'm wondering what kind of church you're participating in. I don't know how to read the Bible. I certainly wouldn't know how to preach the gospel without talking about salvation and raising the question uh, about, are you saved? And if that seems totally awkward to you, what have you been learning in your church? And I'm not trying to pick on you, but look, time is short. And you're not long for this world either way. And the Lord Jesus says to be ready. So don't you think you need to answer that question honestly? Are you saved? 
Are you living life with a passion to please the Lord? Are you humble? Do you confess and forsake sin? Does your heart belong to Christ? Is your Christianity more than empty participation in a tradition? Do you know him? Are you walking with him? Many of you would perhaps, being quite honest, would say, well, I know the answers to those questions and I would have to answer no. Well, I need to remind you of a scripture that says that we're not to be deceived. Be not deceived, the word says. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Amen. Let's be of serious mind. Let's tune in. Let's listen well. And let's receive something from the Lord today, shall we? Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for gathering us around your word. And Lord, truly, we stand here in weakness in many ways. And Lord, without you, we could do nothing. Father, we ask you to bless the reading of your word today. Help us to hear it, to respect it. Help us, Lord, to search the scripture. Help us, Lord, to be hungry for your word today. Speak to many hearts today, Lord. Father, you alone know the hearts of those seated in this building the hearts of those that will listen by television, by radio. Father, so many that need the Savior. I pray today, Father, that you will anoint your word, send your word to that heart that needs the Savior today. Lord, open blinded eyes, unstop deaf ears. Lord, raise men and women from the dead today. They are spiritually so dead. And Lord, we need the Savior so desperately. Give us an ear to hear. Now, Lord, as we stand here today, we lean upon you. Bless your word. Quicken this word. Give it power in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. <clears throat> now, we're looking at our text today, and I'd like to read uh, verses 1 through 13 to get us started. And then I'll have a few words to say about this part of the text. Verse 1 says, and excuse me today, <coughs> if I cough a little bit, I'm actually doing quite well, but sometimes uh, uh, I just have a little problem with uh, allergies, and um, they can work on your throat a little bit. So I might be good for 10 minutes, and then I really have to let you have it. And I doubt Richard will be quick enough to catch it, but uh, just bear with me. And the only upside to that is I doubt any of you will sleep well in service today. And so, so we'll, we're going to have an attentive audience today. I, I, <clears throat> you see what I mean? All right, here we go. Verse 1. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. And the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people and for a spirit of judgment to him that setteth in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, 
precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Now, you may recall that Ephraim consisted of the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Uh, Ephraim, uh, that's the way we might pronounce it as well. But this, uh, when you hear the title Ephraim, it's referring to the 10 northern tribes of Israel. In Isaiah's day, the northern kingdom of Israel, here referred to as Ephraim, is headed for judgment. In time, the instrument of the Lord's judgment upon Ephraim was the Assyrians. In fact, the tone of verse 1 indicates the judgment was now certain. Listen to the language here. Isaiah says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. The word woe pronounced upon the nation spoke of the certain doom determined to fall upon them. You see, woe unto, or woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. So there's no question about what is about to happen. Uh, this pronounce pronouncement is a determination upon the people. There is certain doom determined to fall upon them. This proclamation by the prophet is foretelling of certain judgment upon the nation because of persistent rebellion against God. Now, when I was studying this a little bit, uh, meditating on this word, uh, a verse in the Revelation came to mind. And uh, in similar fashion, in the book of Revelation, this point is illustrated. John the Revelator says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the mist of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Now, when this unfolds in history and these judgments are coming, when the angel pronounces the woe, it is a reality that cannot be avoided. The judgment is certain it's on its way. In this context, the declaration of woe speaks of certain judgment. There's no way to escape. In such a case as this, there's nothing left but to meet God in judgment. So it was in Isaiah's day. Ephraim must meet God in judgment. Perhaps you're thinking this message does not apply to you, but the truth is all those who persist in disobeying the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, will face God in judgment. The New Testament says it this way in the book of Hebrews, where the Bible says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Woe to the man who rejects the word of the gospel, which we preach. Did you notice also as <coughs> we're reading this text, <coughs> excuse me, did you notice the references to drunkards, wine, and strong drink? Strong drink has troubled countless souls and is a leading contributor to the downfall of nations. Look again at verse 7. It says, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. The people erred. That is, they sinned through wine, in this case, intoxicating drink. Through strong drink, they were out of the way. This is exactly what strong drink does for those who toy with this poison. Un, once under the influence of strong drink, men and women stray from righteousness. Or as the text says, says it, they are out of the way. I'm sure you know of people, perhaps uh, before you were converted and came to Christ, you had such experiences. But under the influence of alcohol, people wake up the next morning and they don't even know what they did the night before. 
Notice the failure of the nation's spiritual leaders in this matter. Verse 7 says, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wind. They are out of the way through strong drink. Consequently, they erred in vision and they stumbled in judgment. Is there no lesson here for us today? I ask you, what good has ever come from anyone consuming intoxicating beverages? I'm not talking about the application of a drug to some medical condition. That's an entirely different subject. I'm speaking of the consumption of intoxicating beverages for pleasure. Social drinking is akin to playing with a rattlesnake. Do you understand that today? Your Bible actually brings it out in such language in the book of Proverbs. You're playing with a rattlesnake. Nothing good ever comes of it, but much evil flows from the bottle. Stay away from it at all costs. And I, I preach this when I come across this. I was reading this text and I really want to get to verse 16. And I needed to read the whole text to get the context here to set up verse 16. I said, well, Lord, I'm preaching your word today. We are coming across the subject. I will give out a warning today and I'll do it without apology. You need to stay away from strong drink. It is a poison that doesn't belong in your body. The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. As I said just a moment ago, there's not one good thing that comes out of the bottle. There's nothing but evil there, nothing but destruction, nothing but hurt and harm. And if you toy with it long enough, it will bite you at the last like an adder. It will strike you like the rattlesnake it is. I was interacting with some people recently. Like you, sometimes I come across certain settings where there's alcohol. And not too long ago, I came across one, and I was there for just a little while, and then I left. But I was conversing with two men. They happened to be drinking some of this poison, and I looked at them, and it was appropriate. I could say it. The conversation was such. I just spoke to them briefly, and I said, you know, uh, I hate that stuff right there. Amen. I said it just that way. I said, I hate that stuff right there. It's no good. There's nothing good for you. I said, you boys take it easy. You got to drive home tonight. I said, this stuff will kill you. And I said my piece and I went on about my business. And I got away from them directly. But as Christians today, your Bible teaches you not to be drunk with wine wherein is excess. And uh, enough said about the subject today, but except that I'm going to speak to the preachers here in a minute. But you need to avoid strong drink. Have nothing to do with it. The nation is in a mess, and this is right at the foundation of the mess. Strong drink, wine, they're erring. They're, they're, they're getting out of the way because of strong drink. What can be said about compromising spiritual leaders that consume this poison? Perhaps some of you pastors across paths with this message, I hope so. Are you an example to the families under your influence? Is this poison slowly destroying your ministry and clouding your judgment? Read the word of God that we're coming across today. And the Lord's prophet is speaking to other spiritual leaders, men who should have been examples, men who should have been leaders. And the priest under the old covenant, he had a job to do ministering before the Lord. The prophet had a ministry before the Lord and to the people. They both had a ministry to the people. They were both to be spiritual examples and both this was so widespread in the day that the spiritual leaders were completely out of the way because of strong drink. Amen. Any minister of the gospel that toys with alcohol will be embarrassed before too many years are passed by. I won't start calling names from the pulpit, but I bet you're thinking of some, even as I speak, that have had their names in the newspaper because they were pulled over for DUIs. Ministers. Did that reflect well on your testimony, dear brother? And some of you say, well, I've never done that, but you're toying with that poison. You better get it out of your life and teach your people to get it out of theirs. You say, well, they won't come to church. Well, bless your heart. Are you interested in serving King Jesus or not? Can I just preach a while now? You've done stirred me up in my spirit. Are you interested in following Christ? Are you interested in being filled with the Holy Spirit? Listen, let's live out and out for King Jesus. Amen. You're playing with sin half the time and the people around you can't tell whether you're a Christian or not. Amen. 
Okay, back to the notes. Lest I get myself in too much trouble. Pastors, you should read this passage very carefully. You're not above falling. You're not exempt from the deadly influence of strong drink. Don't toy with it. Can you function as a man of God living under the, this influence? Put this evil completely out of your life. Never let the devil's brew touch your lips. All right, now look at verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. What a sad picture this is. At the end, strong drink wreaks, wrecks the life of a nation as they wallow in their own vomit and moral filthiness. Our nation has been plagued by strong drink for so many years, and so many are so used to it, they think it's strange for a preacher to cry out against it. Uh, the number one drug problem in this country still is, always has been, and still is today, alcohol. Amen. And the abuse of alcohol. Yep. And the other drugs, they're bad. They're, there's nothing good about them. You know, people get into this thing recreationally and they start toying with it. destroys people. The opioid uh, reality, we are all familiar with it. It's tragic beyond belief. We want to help people stay away from it. But all these drugs combined together are not uh, wrecking the nation like alcohol is and has been for decades. If you doubt that, send me an email. I'll get you connected to our government's official statistics at the Department of Drugs and Alcohol and all the rest. They do the research constantly and they give new reports every year. And when I visit the websites, it's the same old broken hearted story. Millions of our people. Well, let's move on. See what time it is. I'm in good shape. All right. Look at verse 9 and 10. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? These verses, in this verse, there's, there's a summary of God's intention for the nation. As I read this, and I know <laughs> there's another application, which I'm going to get to in a minute, but when I read this, I, I know in my heart that the Lord intends for the youth of a nation to learn his word from their earliest days in a deliberate, consistent fashion over the course of their life. Look at this. Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? The 18-year-old, the 22-year-old, is that where it starts? No, it starts right here. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. That means they're about this long. Ethan's sitting back there today. He might not remember this. And I know his mom and dad uh, taught him about the Lord as he's been growing up. But son, when you were a little fella and we propped you up in the living room, the first word that you almost learned was Jesus. And Papa worked on this all the time. I mean, you hung out with me. Hey, mom and dad want me to babysit or sometime I got there. This is what's happening. And uh, I almost before you said dad and mom, you could say Jesus. And this is God's intention. He means for you from your youth, from your infancy, you learn doctrine. That seems kind of, uh, uh, you know, too mature for little ones. Well, that's, that's not accurate. Uh, young people, as they're de de developing and growing, they have the capacity to take in truth hand over foot. And uh, the biggest mistake this nation has ever made was to separate the youth from the Bible. They don't grow up on the Bible anymore. Look at your nation. It's coming apart at the seams and has been for decades. We got away from it. What's God's intention? From the time they're little, they learn doctrine. They learn the truth of God's word. Have at it, church. You better be obeying the Lord in this regard. You don't stop when they're six months, six years, 16 years old. You cut your teeth on the Bible. You grow up on the Bible. You live by the Bible. You feed on the scriptures. And we'll be feeding on the good word of God until King Jesus comes or he calls us home. Amen. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. All right, this is good. Where am I at? Verse 12, let's go down there. It says, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. This verse is speaking of the fact that the Lord offered the people rest if they would repent, if they would listen to his word. Now, this is a repeated theme. 
And we see it often in Israel's experience. And this is the need of our hour. You need to listen to the word of God. You need to come to a place of repentance. You can find a place of rest, a place of refreshing, but the Bible says they would not hear. And this is exactly the problem with most of our world today. They're not ignorant of God's word. They've at least heard it in part, but they don't want to continue on to listen to it, to actually receive it and to walk in it. And consequently, they're going to end up lost. This is sad. They would not hear. Now, as you come to verse 13, this verse is not speaking of the fact that people reverence the word of God. The, the statement that we just read in verse 9 is repeated, but there's a little different reality going on now. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. Now, uh, as I was studying this, uh, different ministers and commentators and different ones were bringing out the fact that, look, what's going on here is the hearing of God's word and the reality that in the life of the nation they were supposed to raise their children on the word and just the word was to saturate their lives. The people got to a place where they had an attitude towards the word and it's like they're saying do we have to listen to these rules rules upon rules standard upon standard these precepts upon precepts and line upon line and all the rest and so but the word of the lord was unto them in that way they were weary of it they didn't want to listen to it anymore and the conclusion of the verse bears this out because it says that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken be careful my friends the instruction of the word of god is not a burden to those who know him now i want to repeat that statement and i don't want to lose you if you're still with me say amen the instruction of the word of God is not a burden to those who know him, as Jesus taught, hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is our attitude down in our heart today as born again children of God. We're born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. We are hungry for the word of God and we're hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Is that your heart today? Listen to me, my friend. If you don't want to hear the word of God, if the instruction of the word of God is like, oh, it's so wearisome to me. Oh, just line upon line, precept upon precept. All the preacher ever does is tell me how to live. Well, didn't you want to know how? I thought you were hungry and thirsty for righteousness. See, this people, they were in a very bad way spiritually speaking and they had grown weary of the word of God and now their attitude and their disobedience and their persistent rebellion has brought them to a place of God's chastening and judgment look at verse 14 15 and 16 the word says wherefore hear the word of the Lord you scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, what's going on here is... The northern kingdom, they've been warned judgment's coming. And as I was studying this, I didn't catch it in my study right off the bat. And as I was rereading this, it occurred to me, and I seen it clearly. I said, wait a minute. The Lord's been talking to Ephraim. But in verse 14, he's talking to Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem and Judea, that was the southern kingdom. And what is occurring here as you study this chapter is the word of the Lord to the north it should have been speaking to the south they should have been listening to and what was happening to them instead of the south receiving the instruction of that chastening <coughs> because they witnessed it they went into uh, the northern kingdom went into captivity the southern kingdom was still free but instead of repenting, instead of really seeking the Lord and setting their own hearts right, they, as the word says, they were scornful men, and they said in their heart, we've made a covenant with death. With hell, we, are we at agreement? 
when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. What the Lord is saying to this people is, you've actually bought into the false security of a covenant with the instrument of my judgment. You have trusted in a falsehood. You refuse to repent. You refuse to obey me. You refuse to be the nation that I want you to be. And now in the South, instead of learning from the, the uh, experience of the North, you're, you're hiding yourself in a lie, in a falsehood. And they did make some kind of agreement with uh, their enemies, supposing that this scourge would not touch them. Now, we had to say all that to get to verse 16. Because <clears throat> when the Lord says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, he gives such a tremendous promise here and he gives us such a tremendous statement. Here's the setting. Here's the backdrop. His people, his covenant people, Israel, they are so out of the way. They are so disobedient. One might be led to believe that because of Israel's behavior, the plan and the work of God would be frustrated and the Lord would not be able to bring to pass his plan, his will. Well, here's the good news. In spite of Israel's unfaithfulness, the Lord is faithful. And right in all this darkness, <clears throat> he says to the people, to his own nation and, and to the nations of the world for that matter, he says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, it is the Lord, as we look at this word, uh, although Israel is unfaithful, her unfaithfulness would not hinder his plan to touch the world through her yet. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Notice several truths found in this verse. First of all, it is the Lord who has laid this stone. Thus, it cannot be moved. The scripture says, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Next, the Lord God has laid this stone in Zion. Zion. The scripture makes it abundantly clear. Zion is another way of referring to Jerusalem. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 5, 7, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Again, the Bible says, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Again, the scripture says, for the Lord hath chosen Zion. Listen, to that. The Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. My friends, this whole world of ours is headed for trouble because the nations as a whole refuse to acknowledge the Lord as the God of Israel <coughs> through whom he has sent the Savior. As a matter of fact, you will hear many attack Zionism. How many of you took note of that in the news or perhaps uh, uh, in other settings. You, you've heard people speak against Zionism. I've heard the enemies of modern day Israel speak against the Zionists and they're going to destroy Israel and wipe her off the face of the map. Many mock Israel and say she has no right to her land and no right to Jerusalem and they're determined to destroy her. Be careful, my friend. You come down on the right side of this controversy. Hear the word of the Lord through his prophet who declares for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Again, the Lord says through his prophet, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. Why, you might ask? The scripture answers the question in Psalm chapter 2, verse 6, where the word says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. <coughs> Hear me today. The Lord has laid in Zion, the Lord has laid in Zion a stone, a stone for testing, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. That stone is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is destined to rule and reign from his throne in Jerusalem upon 
his return. So the scripture says, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away and many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Can somebody say amen to what I'm trying to preach? <coughs> the Lord God has laid this stone in Zion. <coughs> Excuse me. Laid in Zion, a precious cornerstone. I had to just kind of stop my studies and stop all my notes because I thought, you're going to get too long. <coughs> but there's so much to be said about this cornerstone. Yep. And of course, the Lord has laid it. No man can move it. Yes. He's building his program on that stone. It's a sheer foundation. Amen. And everybody must relate to it. Uh, now I'm going to close by calling attention to the fact that the Apostle Peter quotes this verse in the New Testament. And I'll read it for you if you'll listen closely. He writes to the church and he says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Yes. Whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Amen. I'm glad today that I am built on this sure foundation. Amen. Did you notice in the New Testament, Peter says, the Lord laid this chief cornerstone, but see the chief cornerstone, it's the reference point for the building program. And now all the believers are fitted into this building as living stones, as it were. And we are corporately the temple of God. He indwells us. But do you understand that we are built upon this sure foundation? Aren't you glad your feet are on the rock today? I mean, you know, I wish my voice would behave itself. I'd like to just preach a while, but I, I can feel it and it just ain't. But, but I'm telling you, we are, we are fixed on this rock today. Thank you, Jesus. We, we are built on a sure foundation. And when the storms come, this foundation isn't going nowhere. It can beat upon our house, but our house isn't falling. Thank you, Jesus. I've got a sure foundation. And he's precious to my soul today. <clears throat> I'll tell you. We have such a foundation that when that old, they, they talk about this old river called Jordan, you know, and they say that it's deep and it's wide. Well, I don't know much about that. I know what the songwriter's trying to communicate, though. But you see, my feet are fixed on this foundation, and that old river can't do nothing to that foundation. Well, I ain't even worried about that day. I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Jesus Christ will lose none of his. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. I know where I'm going when I take my last breath. Well, let me wrap things up here. <coughs> the Lord Jesus, he makes reference to this passage somewhat 
as well. And he did it in the context of speaking to his own people who were struggling to embrace him as Messiah. And sadly, many of them did not. But he told them and he asked them, he said, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. And on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. <clears throat> Is Jesus Christ a stumbling stone to you today? I pray that you'll humble your heart and come to grips with the truth of the gospel. My friends, God has so loved this world that he sent his son into this world for our salvation. And it's the Lord. Listen to that word again. The Lord says, I lay in Zion. The living God. This is his purpose. This is his plan. He has laid this stone. You can't move it. You could stumble over it or it could grind you to powder. You see, you're going to relate to Christ one way or the other. Why don't you yield your heart to Christ and become one of those living stones that's built on this foundation? You don't have to perish. But did you notice in the verses I just finished with, as Jesus spoke to his people, he said, you've not listened. You've rejected this stone. He said, the blessings that could have been yours, he said, they're going to be taken from you and given to a, another people. I was meditating on that and I thought, well, in some measure, that's me. And that's you. And it's whosoever will that will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. God's own precious covenant people. The physical seed of Abraham, many of them, they failed to embrace their Savior. And to this hour, many of them are still in darkness. And their blessings, their spiritual blessings were taken and given to another people. It's not that they can't be saved. They can still come today and trust Christ. And it's not that God has no program for Israel. He still has a program for Israel. But on a personal, individual basis, if you stumble over Christ, you're going to be broken. And ultimately, that stone will fall upon you. You know, <clears throat> not that long ago, we were studying the book of Daniel in Sunday school. And Daniel saw that stone that was hewed out without hands. And he's seen that stone hit the image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. And when it hit that image, it brought it down to nothing. Amen. That's what you're reading in the Word today. That stone will grind Gentile power down to powder. King Jesus is coming. And my friend, he will rule and reign from Jerusalem, Mount Zion. That's right. You know, I don't know if you've ever said this before, but I'll just wrap it up this way. I am a Zionist. <laughs> I, 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 I respect the Jewish people. We're praying for them. We respect Israel. And uh, <clears throat> we're praying that many of them will come out of darkness and find the Savior before it's too late. But we know this, our Savior is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. And there's a promised kingdom that belongs to him. <clears throat> and he is going to rule and reign in his kingdom from the city of Jerusalem, Amen. Mount Zion. Oh, man. I, I'm excited about going to be with the Lord, aren't you? I'm excited about his program. Amen. And I'm saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. Praise his sweet name. Are you ready to go home to be with the Lord? I mean, come on, church. God is good and we're enjoying his blessings, but our hope's not here. We're just pilgrims here. Our, our heart's already home. It's already there. And we're saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. Oh, yes, we are. You say, well, I'm not feeling quite as excited about that as you are, Brother Russ. Well, perhaps you need to give your heart to the Savior today. You need to turn. 
You say, well, what I've heard you preach today goes against everything I've ever been taught. My religion's different or my tradition's different. My friend, the Holy Spirit is calling you to a place of repentance. Amen. And you've got to change your mind. And you've got to believe this word. Yeah. If you don't hear this word, if you don't receive it, you're going to be just like ancient Israel. Amen. They went backwards. They fell over. They were broken and they were taken. If you die in your sins, you're going you're gonna to be lost. Amen. If you die without confessing Christ and turning to the Savior, you're going to be lost. Don't, don't hide yourself in some lie, some falsehood. You think you're going to escape? You will not escape. The Lord God has laid a stone in Zion, and that stone is the Lord Jesus, and he'll never be moved. If you can either build on him, come to know him, and be one of those living stones, or you will stumble over him, be broken, and he can fall upon you, and grind you to powder. You're going to relate to Christ one way or the other. You say, well, I'm troubled in my heart. Well, you need to make a decision. You need to come to Christ. You need to let the truth of God's word, have, have, let him have his way with you. Will you do that today? Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, <clears throat> we look at your word and there's always much to learn. Lord, speak to us in a very personal way through this message today. Holy Spirit, just do your work in our lives. Sanctify us, set us apart more so to your use. Purge us, Lord, through your word. And Father, build faith. Lord, help us to receive this word today. We need to recognize that you've laid in Zion a foundation, a sure stone, a precious stone, a cornerstone. It can't be moved. And Lord, those who believe in him, they'll never be embarrassed. They'll never make haste. They'll never have to flee. Lord, we're built on the rock. We're standing on the rock today, and we have nothing to fear. Father, help us now. In this moment of decision, help us, I pray. Heads are bowed. And we're praying for just a moment today. What about you? Have you given your heart to the Lord Jesus? Do you know him today? Is he the foundation of your life? It has been a blessing for us to worship together at this time, and we invite you to come worship with us. CBM is located 3809 Maple Avenue in Castalia easily accessible from State Route 2. Take Route 2 to State Route 101 South and turn left onto Maple Avenue. We would love to have you visit. And don't forget, it's your prayers and gifts of love that bring this program into your home each week. Send your gifts of support, prayer requests, and comments to CBM, Box 247, Castalia, Ohio, 44824. CBM Worship is a production and presentation of Christian Broadcasting Ministries. CBM, proclaiming the word.